Good evening and welcome. I'm Stacy Lieberman and I'm the president and CEO of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. Thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed that video tribute from the LA Times. And before we go further, and in the spirit of reconciliation, the Los Angeles Public Library recognizes and acknowledges the first peoples of this land. We pay our respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all indigenous peoples today. Thank you. For those not familiar with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, we are a private nonprofit organization devoted to fundraising, advocacy, and innovative programming in support of the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you to the many li Library Foundation members and board members who are here with us this evening. If you are not yet a member, I hope that you will consider joining the LFLA to continue enjoying programs like the one this evening and to support critical library services and initiatives for children, teens, and adults in Los Angeles to help improve their lives and achieve their dreams. Our winter spring season of the Library Foundation's allowed public programming series is underway, so please pick up a postcard in the lobby or visit lfla.org backslash allowed to see our dynamic season schedule. There's something for everyone. And then there is this evening, honoring P22. Like all of you, I'm an Angelino who has been following P22's journey over the years with awe, admiration, and with concern. When I heard about his passing after days of worrying and waiting, I was struck by our collective outpouring of grief, sadness, and our motivation collectively to act. And when I read the heart-wrenching and beautiful eulogy by Beth Pratt, the regional executive director of the National Wildlife Federation and one of P22's fiercest advocates, I felt both a sense of gratitude to Beth and others who had been chronicling P22's journey and story, and really a renewed appreciation for the power of stories and how they bring us together and unite us. Their words and images gave us a front row seat and made P22 not a distant cougar, but our neighbor and our friend. When I reached out to Beth in late December, we knew there would be other opportunities to honor P22, but we felt that the library where we gather for learning, inspiration, healing, and community would be a fitting place to come together to hear more stories. And we are so thrilled that Beth Pratt, known as P22's BFF, and who is a powerful force of nature, agreed to join us and to help us put together this evening's program. Unfortunately, another force of nature, a snowstorm, <laughs> has prevented her from coming in person, so she will be joining us via Zoom from her home in the Sierras. And in a rundown of the program, Beth will be followed by seven writers, biologists, native leaders, educators, illustrators, and advocates who got to know P22, and then four Angelinos who will share their love letters in the open mic portion of the evening. Following that, Beth will return to share more about how you can get involved in wildlife protection, and books will be available for purchase and signing outside the theater. It is now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, city librarian John Szabo, himself a force of nature and a most beloved Angelino, who was equally uh, enthusiastic to present this evening's program and for the library to honor P22. Thank you again for joining us, and please welcome John. The librarian always has show and tell, so <laughs> we'll put that here. Uh, good evening uh, and welcome uh, to the Central Library, this beautiful, magnificent building that uh, we're so proud of here in Los Angeles. And I uh, just want to begin, in addition to thanking you all for being here, uh, to thank Stacy Lieberman and her colleagues at the Library Foundation of Los Angeles uh, for this very special program this evening and for all that they do to support uh, the LA Public Library. Uh, this uh, program 
uh, our honoring of P-22, our celebration of him, uh, the spark really was Stacy Lieberman, and I, I really want to thank her and, and tell her how much I enjoyed working with her, and uh, I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank the staff, as I always do, of the LA Public Library. Uh, they do magnificent work. Uh, we are uh, doing incredibly dynamic, innovative, life-changing work here at the LA Public Library, and uh, we're proud of it, and I'm proud of the staff that provide those services seven days a week uh, at our 73 libraries. Uh, and this incredible building, uh, it's hard to believe, but in three, just three years, we will be celebrating uh, its uh, 100th birthday. Uh, of course, we're in the new wing now, but the, yes, please, clap. <laughs> um, it is uh, such a love building uh, here in Los Angeles and, um, uh, again, opened in uh, 1926 uh, and then, of course, this wonderful wing in the early 1990s. And we are also right now, speaking of birthdays, uh, in the midst of a celebration, 150 days of celebration of the 150th birthday of the Los Angeles Public Library as an institution and, I would say, also a force of nature <laughs> in this city. Um, there are not many institutions that have lasted for 150 years in L.A., and uh, I think all of us in L.A. should be proud of that. I know I'm proud of it, and I think, uh, frankly, programs like this evening are one of the reasons we've been around so long, um, always trying to speak to what's happening in our city, bringing people together from across this city, uh, and uh, always trying to be current with, um, with all of the collections that we have and the programs that we offer. Uh, we are celebrating the 150th birthday, which actually was on December the 7th of uh, 2022, and again, 150 days of celebration with reading challenges, public programs, children's activities, teen activities. There's even a virtual escape room, and I think to get out of the virtual escape room, you have to like know factoids about the LA Public Library history, so good luck. It's kind of scary, but uh, it's been popular. Uh, and as we uh, are on this stage and as we will have um, uh, so many of our friends and, and colleagues come and um, speak about P-22 and what P-22 meant uh, to the City of Angels and to Southern California, I am reminded of all of the amazing things and the variety of things that happen on this stage. Just last week uh, we had, and we have lots of citizenship ceremonies here, that, and that's associated with our New Americans work helping uh, people become citizens, um, providing immigration services here at the Los Angeles Public Library. But the citizenship ceremony last week was particularly special because 24 members of the United States military, uh, immigrant members of the United States military, naturalized and became U.S. citizens. Um, and a uh, very emotional day, and also many people are unaware that um, non-citizens do serve uh, in our United States Armed Forces. Um, I am also reminded of a partnership with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where a scientist, uh, she brought uh, a replica of the Mars rover for a program for teens. The, this entire room was filled with uh, teen library patrons and I remember the Mars rover rolled over the head of teen services for the LA Public Library and made the city librarian very nervous about it. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was that was very exciting, and we also do career online high school graduation ceremonies here. Uh, the library offers an accredited online high school diploma for adults who were unable to get that degree for a variety of reasons while they were teenagers, and uh, over 800 have graduated, and uh, those are tearjerker ceremonies that happen right here in this room as well. Uh, yes. Um, and we also had a punk music program in this with Exene Cervinka, and uh, one of the people in the audience who just walked in off the street was RuPaul. And we went to RuPaul and said, would you do a program at the library? And later RuPaul did a, was on this stage doing a program. And then the last one that I'll mention is uh, in the early 1990s when this wing of the library reopened, King Charles, then Prince of Wales, uh, got a tour of the building and also was on this stage. And if you want to see photos of that, we have it in TESA, which is the library's digital portal where we digitize uh, all of the library's images. Uh, this also is the room where we live streamed the celebration of life service for P-22, which was at the Greek Theater. When we heard that it had sold out, we knew that Angelinos wanted to be part of that. And so in this space and at 10 of our branch libraries, we live streamed it. And uh, that was uh, really wonderful and a wonderful way to bring uh, people together in another way to honor uh, P-22. And today's program, 
uh, it's certainly about honoring P-22 and what he meant to our city of angels in Southern California, but it's also an opportunity to learn. Uh, and the library is uh, a lifelong learning institution. And the program also connects beautifully with our neighborhood science initiative, which um, focuses on biodiversity. Uh, we actually check out neighborhood science kits uh, from our libraries and uh, patrons can crowdsource wildlife uh, data and, uh, and have it be used uh, by scientists through the LA BioBlitz Challenge. Um, and uh, all of this recognizing the need to nurture and preserve native wildlife here in LA. And to help remind Angelinos of this, uh, we today have launched, as you know because you saw it in the, <laughs> in the lobby, uh, a very special limited edition library card. There are just 25,000 of them. That sounds like a lot, but they'll go very, very, very fast. They're available at all 73 libraries. I have the big one here, my show and tell, <laughs> with that wonderful, iconic photograph. Uh, and then um, the actual card, be sure to get one of these. Uh, but we're really excited about it. Our staff have done a great job of teasing it out through social media. Uh, we are also uh, in conversation right now about how we can take all of these wonderful reminiscences and stories about P-22 and what Angelinos have written and said and uh, thought about P-22 and creating a very special uh, archive here at the LA Public Library uh, that, that, that can preserve all of this so that five years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, uh, we'll have that, that memory because it's important to preserve. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for your support of the LA Public Library and the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. And now, joining us via Zoom, please give a very warm welcome to California Regional Director for the National Wildlife Federation, our friend Beth Pratt. Hello, can you hear me, everybody? <laughs> it's a little hard doing this blind. I can't see or hear anything. So uh, Tiffany, am I coming through okay? Great. I am so sorry I can't be there with everybody. Uh, all of you, Miguel, Sherry, Alan, and Laura, and more, uh, we all connected over P22. Um, but uh, snow is coming down hard, and I'm about to have three feet uh, uh, through the weekend. So my apologies. I really did want to be there. And my thanks to the Los Angeles Public Library and the Foundation and Stacy and John and Allowed. Uh, libraries hold a special place in my heart. So uh, I'm really sorry to miss this event in person, but glad technology can bring me here. Um, I'm still processing, you know, P22 and his death. It's been hard. And I think the memorial was such a, a good event where we all came together, but it's still hard to think of P22 not being in Los Angeles. Um, the day after I got to say goodbye to him, and it was the most profoundly moving moment of my life to talk and sit in front of P22, but it was also the saddest moment of my life that I will have to live with for a long time, knowing I could do nothing to save him. But his legacy is so amazing in connecting the world as we've seen, and also beyond that, being a game changer for conservation and a game changer for how we think about wildlife, which I think is why we're all here with, with these different perspectives. But that day after, after you know, he was euthanized, I remember looking at Griffith Park and sadly thinking it will never be the same. But then I thought about that for a minute and I actually felt some hope. Yeah, it'll never be the same. And that's the point. A mountain lion could live there and we'll never be able to look at it the same because we'll know the possibility. And I think that's what he represents. So what I wanted to do tonight was read for you um, from my book, When Mountain Lions Are Neighbors, because like a lot of you, when I first read and Martha Groves is, is there, the, the article on P22 in the LA Times, he just so captivated my imagination. So in my book, When Mountain Lions Are Neighbors, the first chapter, I recreated from his point of view, his journey. So I was just going to read a little bit about it then. This is how P-22, or how I imagined he came to Griffith Park. And so I'm going back to the beginning. P-22 just may be the Neil Armstrong of his kind, 
A quick glance at his route on a map shows he had to be a bit mad to even attempt his journey. To get to his new territory of Griffith Park, he must cross two of the busiest freeways in the United States. Imagine soft padded paws fitted for bounding over snow and boulders, touching the asphalt of the first eight line highway, known as one of the worst roads in the country. Even in the middle of the night, the 405 never slows and the highway thrums with mechanical noise and explodes with the mad dance of headlights. When faced with the living, breathing monster of the 405, most cats do an abrupt about face or get mangled by a few tons of moving steel. But P-22, with his tenacity or luck or both, somehow manages to cross. There is no way of knowing how he navigates the formidable obstacle of the road, whether he uses an under or overpass or bolt straight across. All have been attempted by other cats and many haven't lived to tell the tale. My guess, he probably did what most of us do when confronted with the Los Angeles freeways, floor it and hope for the best. Imagine that bound, one large step for cougar kind. Mountain lions can jump a span of 45 feet. Someone might have seen P-22, startled by the view of him dashing across the road in a blur of manic motion. But since mountain lions are not a usual reality in the LA mountains, a long tail or autumn brown coat in the headlights was probably attributed to a large dog. His miraculous feet, however, only pushes him into more densely populated areas where he must keep going, perhaps thinking to himself he has hit the point of no return. I imagine his final miles is akin to a thirsty man wandering in a desert, hoping for signs of water with every step. Then like a mirage, the Hollywood Hills appears, a green expanse filled with deer. Even more importantly, he senses no indication of another male lion. Cougars leave scent marks of urine or feces or scrapings on trees to designate their territory and want other lines to keep out. One last push. He might stand on the Mulholland Overlook at night, gazing at the city lights of downtown to the south and the lack of lights on the landscape due east, another promising sight. He might consider his options for crossing the 101, peeking out of his hiding place while he rests during the day, smelling the heavy stench of gasoline and exhaust, the noxious perfume of the freeways. Perhaps he's also curious about those giant white letters jutting out of the hillside. P-22 somehow navigates the 101, ranked by some as the worst commute in America. He might pause a moment with a triumphant look back at the speeding cars, then pick up his pace for the last half mile to his destination, sauntering through the winding roads and quiet neighborhoods, taking note of the Hollywood Reservoir, a place he will soon frequent. If cougars feel relief, I am sure P-22 does at this moment. No houses, no other male cougars, plenty of deer, hashtag winning. And then he creates a marking as significant in the cougar world as the famous boot print on the moon. He scrapes a tree with his claws, forcefully and with much satisfaction, and claims Griffith Park for his own. Thank you, P-22. And thank you all for loving him as much as I did. Alan Salazar is a tribal elder and a tribal member of the Fernanda Fernandinho and Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. Here is Alan Salazar. Lamanat Netawan Puchukyayak Sekpa Chukoyanga Tapu Nikasin Netawan Alan Salazar. Hello, I'm Alan Salazar, fast runner. I'm from the villages of Pasekpa, Chogoyanga, and Tapu. Pasekpa is San Fernando, California, where I was born, where my tribal ancestors come from. We trace back to the Tatavion village of Chogoyanga. Currently, Magic Mountain is built over it. We're gonna tear those damn things down and get it, get it back here. <coughs> and the Chumash village of Tapu, Tapu Canyon in Simi Valley. You know, I've, I've 
have considered myself extremely blessed to work and meet with wonderful people, Beth, Robert Rock, the scientists, the environmentalists, the, the native plant people, uh, canoe builders. But my people, we are clam people. We use the animals as teachers. We use them as symbols. We have the bear clan. We have the eagle clan. We have the mountain lion clan. We have the spider clan, the lizard clan. And when I look back and reflect on, on P-22, I realized a few things as a tribal person that he wasn't just a teacher. He taught us many lessons. But in the Chumash language, he was a wont. In the Chataviam language, he was a tomir. He was a chief. He was a leader. Those of you that are from my age bracket know what I mean when I go, he wasn't your average mountain lion or average bear. Uh, and the tribal community has, has come together and united around uh, P-22, our admiration for him, uh, our respect for him, uh, the respect that a leader deserves. Uh, probably one of the biggest responsibilities I, I, I've had in my life, and I've had a, had a few, uh, is to oversee and help organize a proper burial for P-22. We can't tell you a lot about it, but he will be given a respectful burial. And to give you a little insight into why it's so important to tribal people. I've said this many times in the last month or so, the last six, seven weeks, and I knew this a year ago, I knew this five years ago. What happened to the mountain lions in California happened to my ancestors. We hunted mountain lions because of a false fear we had of them. Instead of taking the time to understand them, we feared them and killed them. That happened to my people. That giant territory that a mountain lion should have, 100 miles, 150 miles, shrunk down to nine miles, and really not even nine miles, because in that nine mile little circle that he lived in his last 10 years of his life was us. How to survive in a hostile environment. My people know how to do that. When I sat right there and listened about the 150 years of libraries in Los Angeles. I have to admit and confess, I thought that was really cute. Because we have 15,000 years of tribal knowledge in Los Angeles. And we struggle and struggle every day to save that knowledge and to pass it on. If we learn nothing else from P-22, it's to understand and appreciate the strength and beauty of someone. Puchuk Yayak, fast runner. 
I will challenge anyone in this room right now to a 50 yard dash. <laughs> That's how bold and con confident and cocky I am. P22 would smoke me in about the first 20 yards. <laughs> At age 12, he killed and took down a deer. We whine and complain if we don't get a parking space within 100 yards <laughs> of Whole Foods. There's many lessons we can learn from P22. And as Beth was saying, and, and I forget which sp speaker it was uh, already, uh, I'm old. Uh, I encourage everyone, because I know this from personal experience, there's nothing more liberating than going outside at midnight and it's quiet and go down by the swimming pool at my condo complex and go by the big elm tree and mark my territory. <laughs> it's liberating. <laughs> There's so many lessons we can learn from P22. Um, and, and I'll close with this. Here's a lesson that most of us don't think that P22 taught us. Yes, he took down a deer at age 12. He also took a few chihuahuas, which as I said at the Greek theater, we all know chihuahuas talk a lot of shit, so they probably had it coming. <laughs> but the owner of those dogs and, and, and those pets that lost, lost them to P22, as far as I know, they understood that P22 was doing what comes naturally. Stop and think about where we're at today in America. I've been working with California Fish and Wildlife uh, who environmentalists and nature lovers brutalize and, and, and demonize their humans like us trying to do the best job they can. Do we agree with everybody in this room? Do we agree with all our politicians? No. But let's not damn people for doing what comes naturally to them. What is their strength? Developers develop. Oil producers pump oil. We may not agree with that, but they're not evil. I apologize for, for getting on my soapbox. Uh, but P-22 was a teacher, and we've only scratched the surface on what he's taught us. Open your minds, open your hearts. Peace out, homies. Thank you. Martha Groves, a lifelong journalist who had the good fortune to be the first reporter to write about P-22 for the Los Angeles Times. They didn't follow directions. I was supposed to come in front. Okay. El Soltero, The Bachelor. Of the many nicknames floated for L.A.'s resident puma, including the Brad Pitt of mountain lions, <laughs> El Soltero felt to me the most poignant. After all, P-22's decision to cross a couple of freeways and enter Griffith Park in 2012 doomed him to a pretty solitary existence. Griffith Park wasn't nearly big enough for him, 
Luckily, he didn't pay too much attention to the boundaries, but it certainly wasn't big enough for him and a mate. Before P-22, there was another little mountain lion that had a problem in Santa Monica. Some of you might remember this. He came a little too close to a preschool and was cornered in an office complex. And he made a great escape attempt, and an officer fired his gun and killed the mountain lion. So a couple months after that, that was May of 2012, and a couple months after that, the city of Santa Monica decided to change its strategy in the hope of saving future wildlife if this sort of um, episode occurred again. And that's when I came on the mountain lion scene. And I interviewed Jeff Sickich of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. And while we were talking, he mentioned to me <laughs> that a mountain lion was living in Griffith Park. And I said, what? <laughs> and wait. And that was the start of my reporting about P-22. So I spent some time with Jeff in the park and uh, wrote the first story about P-22, and it truly was a career highlight for me. And just seeing P-22 on the front page of the LA Times and people getting very excited about this, people who were hiking in the park, people were very tuned in to this cat. And as you know, he made many, many appearances on ring cameras, walking through the neighborhoods. He visited LA DWP property. He visited Forest Lawn Cemetery. And you know, he visited the LA Zoo and chose not the popcorn that's available, but a koala. <clears throat> so he munched on that koala, and that really worried me because I thought, oh, my God, the city's going to go berserk. Somebody's going to get a predation permit or something to off him. No, the zoo handled it so beautifully and said he was, you know, our bad. We didn't put the koala in a safe enough zone. So, so that was very reassuring to me, and I realized that the city of L.A. was on this puma's side. So I wrote about P-22 and the various issues about him, including mange. Remember that picture of P-22 with mange? So I wrote about the problem with rodenticides and uh, interviewed Keon Schulman and all the people working for poison-free Malibu. And that was another topic because P-22 got mange probably because of exposure to rat poison. And Jeff Sickich came to the rescue again, captured him, and treated him, and with one treatment was able to solve that mange problem. So that was a blessed relief. Once again, P-22 dodged the bullet. So anyway, as time went on, I also wrote about the wildlife crossing. And this was a plan that had been in the works for a very long time. And we all know that these cats have such a problem navigating our territory because we've broken it up with roads and residential areas. So it was very important to me that this wildlife crossing get built. And after I retired from the Los Angeles Times, where P-22 made many appearances on the front page, I held a fundraiser for the wildlife crossing and Beth Pratt came and she brought her P-22 cardboard cutout and posed with all my friends and she had her P-22 tattoo and we raised some money for the wildlife crossing. So that was a blessed relief to me and I am so thrilled that I was able to attend the groundbreaking of the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing in Agoura Hills and it's a wonderful <laughs> victory. So P-22 has stayed in my heart, and when I remodeled my falling down garage into a living unit, I bought Steve Winter's famous photo of P-22 in front of the Hollywood sign, and I put it up on the wall above the fold-out couch, and so I call that space my cougar den. <laughs> and <laughs> I know that when I heard the news about P-22 being euthanized, I was hiking, and as some of you might know if you were at the Greek, 
I literally was in a park in the Santa Monica Mountains and near a sign that said, there might be a mountain lion here, so watch out. And I got this news alert, and I burst into tears. <laughs> and my friends were, what happened? What happened? I said, P-22 is gone. But P-22 lived an amazing life, taught us amazing things, has changed the future for other wildlife, and it's really a wonderful thing that he has done. And I wish him peace and good hunting, and I'll see him in my living unit. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Laura Nelson will be joining us on Zoom. Laura Nelson is an investigative and enterprise reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Nelson was part of the team that won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the San Bernardino terrorist attack. She has recently wrote about P-22. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you tonight, and I'm sorry that it's only virtually. Uh, unfortunately, I tested positive for COVID this morning and am isolating at home, but uh, I am with you in spirit and so glad to be a part of this event. Um, as you just heard from Martha, um, P-22 was a real favorite of the LA Times. In fact, he showed up in Griffith Park the same year that I started working at the paper. Um, and we, we loved P-22. We covered many of his exploits over the years. The time he got mange, uh, leading to what I like to think of as his DUI mugshot photo. Uh, the time he crawled under a house in Los Feliz and caused a media frenzy, uh, news helicopters and all. Uh, the time he ate a koala at the LA Zoo, allegedly. <laughs> um, I enjoyed reading all those stories, but at first I didn't really consider myself a P-22 super fan. Um, maybe I thought it's just because I'm allergic to cats. But that changed when the LA Times decided that P-22 deserved his own celebrity profile, and I jumped at the chance to write it. What a great assignment. Hearing from dozens of people who'd studied and loved this animal from afar gave me a sense of just how deeply his presence had moved and changed our city. That piece ran last April, and in December, I wrote P-22's obituary. I've stitched together parts of both of those stories, and I'm going to read from them tonight. <clears throat> Not long after Michael McMahon moved to the Cahuenga Pass, a friendly hiker in Griffith Park warned him to watch out for mountain lions. Was that a joke? McMahon wondered. He went home and Googled it, and there the animal was in a photo that was made famous in 2013 in National Geographic, tawny, sinewy, prowling below the Hollywood sign. A few years later, McMahon decided to start installing his own motion-activated cameras on canyons and trails, and soon he'd captured his first video of the elusive puma. He's recorded him 75 times since, making him one of the most prolific chroniclers of the urban mountain lion known as P-22. Quote, P-22 and I were at similar stages in our lives. We're just two older bachelors roaming the Hollywood Hills, said McMahon, 58, who has the puma's face tattooed on his left shoulder. He's got this air of mystery to him. You just never know when he's going to show up. To reach Los Feliz from his likely birthplace in the Santa Monica Mountains, P-22 would have made an improbable and risky journey through the Hollywood Hills, crossing the 405 and 101 freeways. He soon became a bona fide celebrity, appearing in the pages of both the LA Times and the National Geographic. Scientists had initially assumed that P-22 would leave Griffith Park to find a mate and find more space to roam, but instead he stayed here for more than 10 years. Catching, him a, catching a glimpse of P-22 on a nighttime prowl became one of the most coveted celebrity sightings in LA. Like many cougars, sometimes known as ghost cats, P-22 was shy by nature. For years, he preferred the park's dark canyons and hillsides, and occasionally a darkened city sidewalk, to more populated areas but he had recently started to venture deeper into LA, wandering as far south as Silver Lake. The discovery of P-22 in Griffith Park led to one of the most unusual elements of his life, the city taking his side instead of demanding that he be removed. Big cats prowl large swaths of the United States, but few cities would allow a cougar to live in their midst, let alone stay there for more than 10 years. P-22 went on to achieve the kind of lasting fame which most Angelinos can only dream. 
His photogenic face, including those dark markings around his eyes that looked like eyeliner and those lines on his cheeks that looked like a little bit like makeup contouring, that face appeared everywhere in a documentary and even in an exhibit at the LA County Natural History Museum. He was featured on socks, tattoos, bumper stickers, Christmas sweaters, and by order of the LA City Council, every October 22nd was celebrated as P22 Day. He also became a talisman of sorts for Los Angeles, a sign that something this beautiful and this wild can exist amid all this concrete. His presence taught us that LA is far wilder than it appears, with one of the highest levels of biological diversity of any big city in North America. Some scientists had warned against anthropomorphizing P-22, but honestly, we really couldn't help but see ourselves in the big cat story. Like so many Angelinos, he battled traffic on the 405 in the Sepulveda Pass, and he never wanted to do it again. He was an aging bachelor who adjusted to a too small space in the big city, waiting there for a mate who might never arrive. And others identified with his story, crossing borders and freeways in search of a place he could call home. Thank you. Sherry Mangel Ferber. Sherry Mangel Ferber is an author and retired teacher. She's a volunteer for Save LA Cougars and returns to the classroom often to teach about local wildlife. Welcome, friends of P22, wherever you may be tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to read my letter that I wrote to P22. Dear P22, you let us share your journey and became our guide. You led us to an understanding of what it is that urban wildlife needs, not just to survive, but to thrive. But just as importantly, you taught us that we need connectivity with each other in order to create a pathway for the protection of all wildlife. Your story of determination, courage, perseverance, and loneliness needed to be told, and we wanted to do so from your perspective. I remember going to sleep one night in an impasse for the right words to complete our second book. In the dark of night, I opened my eyes and in awe saw a vision of you as if you were really present, facing me, and you spoke the very words I needed to be able to complete the narrative of your life. This has been my journey with you, a mountain lion I never met, but came to love so much that I had to tell you a story, and I tattooed you on my arm. Because of you, I've become friends with some of the most incredible people in my life, those who are making the dreams of connectivity a reality, and for that I will always be grateful. The last two lines from the park read, they tell me to stay. They tell me I am home. You are home now forever in our hearts, P22. You are in my heart. I love you. Alexander Vidal. He's the creator and illustrator of a picture book called Crossing Cougar, how Hollywood's celebrity cougar helped build a bridge to city wildlife. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexander Vidal. I'm an illustrator and sometimes author whose work often centers or usually centers around wildlife. And as somebody whose career is so focused on nature and wildlife, I am often asked why I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> and this question usually comes from people who don't live here, people who associate Los Angeles with the Kardashians and the Real Housewives. Um, but for those of us who are lucky enough to live here, we know that this is a place of incredible biodiversity. This is a city of coyotes and mule deers, of rattlesnakes and black bears, of cougars, and for a time of P-22. So, I actually feel like I have a little bit of a similar trajectory to P-22 in some ways. I actually moved back to Los Angeles around two, uh, 2012, right when he was crossing into Griffith Park. And for the past eight years, I've lived just below Griffith Park. I've lived in Los Feliz and Beechwood. I now live in Silver Lake. So in a way, I've always considered him a little bit of a neighbor. So in uh, 2019, I was asked to illustrate a book called Cougar Crossing by Meek Pekas from Beach Lane Books. 
and it was the fastest I've ever said yes to a job. <laughs> I, I've been so obsessed with him for so long, it was such an honor to get to illustrate his life story um, and to get to share that story with the world. It was also an incredible opportunity to show the world what an incredible wild ecosystem Los Angeles is. On a personal level, it was also a great opportunity to get out from behind my desk. As an illustrator, I have to spend a lot of time at home doing a lot of illustration, so it was great to get to spend every morning out hiking, trying to get ideas for research and consider that work. Um, it was incredible to spend that time in his territory, but toward the end of his life, as he started to venture even further south, he actually started to come into my neighborhood. I live now in Silver Lake, and toward the end of his life, he unfortunately started to venture further and further south into more and more unsafe territory, including an encounter with uh, someone walking their dogs that happened just streets away from mine. So for the first time, I actually experienced a little bit of fear around P22, which I'd never felt. Um, after feeling so much like he was a neighbor of mine, it was a little strange to suddenly fear the possibility of actually meeting him on my streets. But there's a value to that fear. P22 was a reminder of the responsibilities that we share in sharing our world with wildlife. And this is true wherever you live. Wherever you are, you share a wild ecosystem with so many countless incredible creatures. And that's an incredible blessing that we have on this planet. And it's one that we should take seriously. I've always been someone who will stop mid-conversation to look at a bird that I see or to watch a squirrel or a lizard, and for a while, P22 made it feel like everyone in Los Angeles was doing the same. We were all looking up from our phones and our lives and recognizing what an incredible wild space we live in and starting to recognize the incredible wild creatures that are our neighbors. So even though he's gone, I hope that's a lesson that we'll continue to share. Thank you. Miguel Ortayana. Miguel is an environmental, or, um, environmental educator and wildlife biologist. He works at the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum. All right, thank you for, for having me tonight. Um, this is still, like Beth said, something that I'm still processing. Um, I um, am fortunate to be the person um, to first discover the first photo of P22 uh, 10 years ago through a grassroots study called the Griffith Park Connectivity Study. Um, <laughs> thank you. And I'm here today um, just to talk about um, just a, a few of those memories. I have so many. I've been photographing him for the past 10 years, but I'll start with the discovery itself. Seeing that massive puma butt on my computer screen <laughs> And Martha Groves first uh, quoted me on this, and I use it all the time, which is it felt like seeing Bigfoot or La Chupacabra for the first time. It was like finding urban legend. People would send in their photos to me, knowing that I was out studying the park. Oh, I found a mountain lion. Here's a, and there was a photo of their cat or their dog or, or something like that. And finally, there was proof, um, uh, undeniable proof of a mountain lion. And, um, and then just having those first moments, I was going through, uh, it was a big year for me. That was the year I got married uh, to my wife and still felt really young. Uh, didn't have a broken foot back then. Um, wasn't as fragile. Um, seeing, having those moments just in the park, um, seeing his tracks, um, and then, of course, um, having those memories of me uh, getting those photos of P22 and checking the footage and then minutes later, seeing that he was there, uh, just minutes after me at that same location, knowing that he was potentially looking at me the whole time, um, just just giving me my space. I was giving him his space, and um, and then thinking about moments of hiking in on his kills and seeing big mule deer carcasses out there. And then there's one time that really speaks to his elusiveness, not just him like looking out, looking at me while I'm checking my cameras. Um, but looking at his, the kills and not only finding a deer carcass, but one time finding an owl on top of that deer carcass because that is how elusive he was. He was not only able to sneak up on a deer, but then sneak up on an owl that was feeding on that deer multiple times. And, and so that same elusiveness, 
um, captured the heart of my, my family, my daughter. And as a kid that grew up in L.A., disconnected from nature, not feeling uh, that I had a really a, a place in the conservation field, um, then being able to give my daughter um, that bridge um, and many other kids that bridge and, and, and through photos, through articles, through children's books, um, people creating bridges between nature and um, us um, through P22. And that's the gift that we'll keep on giving. Um, and my, my daughter grew up in a, in a L.A., um, with P22, only with the LA with P22, and a Griffith Park that she only knows that has P22. And that is a, a magical era, the P22 era in LA. And I'm so grateful that my children overlapped completely with that up till this past December. Um, and my son, now uh, another kind of addition of the family, having at least a little bit of time overlapping with him, he's only three years old, um, is just something that, that I hope that will kind of keep at least a little, uh, at least a little part of their, um, inside of their memories um, forever, and that impact and that access that they felt that I didn't feel, um, that they'll pass on to that next generation. Um, and as, I mean, we look at um, those moments of, of me with my family and these final photos of an exhibit being created in his honor um, and also the final photo that I got of him kind of coming through the fence and multiple other photos like that um, that inspired so many to, to, to think about him and keep, them, keep him on their minds, keep nature on their minds. Um, again, like, like Alex said, Look, I mean, looking up from their phones, taking a moment to stop thinking about themselves, thinking about not only wildlife, but their neighbors and what they can do for them, how they can be better at coexisting. And, um, and I, I just, I'll just end with that, is that um, I got married on, in 2012 in the San Diego Safari Park, <laughs> and that is where he was put to rest. He was put down at the San Diego Safari Park. Um, so there's so many personal connections that I hope everybody kind of holds on to because it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve you well for many years to come. Thank you so much. We had an open mic uh, solicitation that went out, and these are some of the people. Um, and so Amy Roche, could you come? Thank you. So good to be in the room with so many people who loved him. Um, I'm Amy Roche, and uh, this is the P22 monologue from my show, The Animal Monologues did it around LA a little bit in New York, um, 2017 to 2019. And uh, haven't done it in a while, but I'm excited to share it with you tonight. When I was first starting out, all I wanted was my own territory. I never wanted to be famous. Hollywood found me. P-22, the only mountain lion to cross the 101 and 405 alive. Plenty of humans in their speeding tin cans wish they could say the same, but I didn't mean it as some daredevil feat. The Santa Monica Mountains were nice. Plenty of space, plenty of meat. I love the west side. <laughs> but I had to get away from P-45. <laughs> Once he killed all those alpacas in the pen, shit just got weird. They were after our heads. Still, had I known I'd be alone here for years, I might have stayed. Uh, but when my cousin started hitting on me, I knew I had to get my own place. <laughs> now they're carrying this cardboard cutout of me all over town. On Valentine's Day, they even put me on Tinder. <laughs> but I don't know what they were talking about. There weren't any cougars. 
Griffith Park's a beauty. Few mule deer, a couple coyotes, I'm good for the month. Top of the food chain, it's an easy life. <laughs> Do you ever have that recurring dream where you're the last one on earth? You keep looking around for someone, anyone, but you're all that's left? Fame isn't all it's cracked up to be. When the full moon comes over the mountain, I just want someone next to me. And you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think I'm finally in the place in my life where I can be a good dad. <laughs> Kittens or no, I know there's someone out there for me. Eight lanes of traffic is no joke, but if I can do it, so can she. <laughs> my cave is real nice. Been decorating it for since 2013, all tucked up in the park, pink quartz, shiny metals, green glass worn down by the trail, and the entrance is framed by branches like paws outstretched in a deep sleep after a big meal. Hollywood can say what they want about me. I never cared about the movies. I'm looking for my one and only, my pride. Thank you. Tommy Boone. Hello, uh, my name's Tommy Van Bui. I'm a librarian and I have sweaty palms because public speaking. <laughs> but, uh, I tried to commit it to memory, but I couldn't because my memory is ravaged by television. <laughs> but here we go. <clears throat> of laurels and loss, a canticle to P-22. By the surly moonlight you prowl and tread on thunder among the thickets, untangling lush arteries of lightning with obsidian and early morning amber eyes, sagebrush and shadows, twilight and thrums, slinking by chorus of car alarms and crosswalk chirps, the burrs burnished to your brow, with a crown of nettles, anointing your nocturnal rites. From chaparral convenience you survey, once wayward mammoths bogged in Brea, to buses bulging in rush hour rigmarole today. The years heaped happenstance on your hind legs and glom to your scruff the hearsay of centuries old. Lap cool waters from your own ancient paw prints, communing with the trickle of erstwhile epochs and scuff your whiskers at primordial HOV lanes. Stalk silently amongst our memory fragments, conducting the orbit of midnight helicopters by cadence of your arched ten TV tail, skulk silky by crass crepuscular light. And I have a little short essay. I'll make it as painless as possible. Ode to isolation. During the pandemic, there was a mad throng to the outdoors. Hordes and hordes dusted off and laced up their bygone trail shoes and made a dash for Griff Park. And a trail that was already brimming with people was made all the more hectic with a pitter-patter of abundant people, dilly-dallying hiking dilettantes, elbow to elbow at times. And to avoid the maddening multitudes, I would dodge the congested parking and all-around turbulence by hiking in the early wee hours. Just when the sun was peeking over the horizon and flooding the verdant valleys with auburn early morning light, it was a respite. It was a routine. It was dawn bathed right of solace. But embedded in that deliberate solitude was a nibbling dread. When the chaparral absorbs the complete absence of sound, with just the acoustics of clouds above scraping against one another like granite, and the deluge of dew receding as rush hour begins to rustle silently in the distance, a tsunami of unease washes over one soul during those unobserved primeval hours. And you start pining for the comforts of frenzy and hurly-burly again. The starkness seeps into the bone marrow and rumbles restlessly in the sternum. Alas, relief. It's sweet relief to remember that I'm not alone in Griffith Park. Not ever. That in these lush rolling hills are a kingdom of feathers, claws, and antenna, from the smallest pill bug to the burliest of bobcats, and the all-seizing alarm of apes, knowing that while not visible, P-22 is silently skulking somewhere next to me, maybe not in proximity, but in spirit, side by side. Two urban oddballs trying to make sense of the flux and flummox of Los Angeles. Thank you. Good drive. Terrence Butcher.
Wow, these lights are bright. <laughs> Bear with me for just a moment. So I'm Terrence Butcher. Um, when I noticed the invitation to participate in the open mic tonight, I had a few things on my mind regarding P22. Never met him, of course, uh, but I've been a wildlife enthusiast um, since childhood. And I said, well, I'll write down some informal things and uh, send it in and we'll see what happens. And lo and behold, I'm here. I've been to a lot of uh, presentations here over the years. I, it's my first time on stage, so it's rather exciting. So I'm going to be reading a little bit from my phone, and the print is really tiny, so keep that in mind. But this is what I was thinking of. So I grew up, like many of my generation, watching on uh, Sunday evenings The Wonderful World of Disney, 7 p.m. NBC. And um, I recall TV specials like... Uh, that featured pumas like uh, Run Appaloosa Run in which uh, a puma is uh, threatening a horse and another one called Return of the Big Cat in which a young girl uh, played by current real housewife of Beverly Hills, Kim Richards, is so mortified, so scared by the appearance of an approaching cougar that she's rendered mute and remains so for quite some time. So. It occurred to me recently that uh, Disney so often depicted pumas as these sort of malicious assassins, ready to pounce on any creature, man included, that they stumbled across. The company redeemed itself somewhat with, uh, if you've seen the sweet sort of family-friendly Charlie the Lonesome Cougar, in which uh, sort of a semi-feral cougar, which is almost like a pet, exists around mankind and doesn't really harm anybody. And that actually played in theaters. That wasn't uh, strictly a TV special. But typically, Disney and Hollywood at large um, trained us to fear the second largest wild cat of the Americas. And they did that job exceedingly well. However, statistically speaking, Puma's overwhelmingly avoid encounters for, with humankind. And for most of his life, P-22 was no exception. I recall seeing some hidden camera footage of him at a wildlife presentation at USC done by Miguel Ordeana some years back. Uh, he was one of the, Miguel, you were one of the presenters at the uh, discussion. So P-22 was standing by a trail in his neighborhood of Griffith Park, sort of peering into the nighttime gloom. And a few minutes later, a hiker, we saw this on hidden camera, strode by that same spot, but P-22 was nowhere to be seen. He had vanished quietly into the darkness, ever elusive, protecting himself and, however unwittingly, also keeping us safe. This situation changed irrevocably shortly before his death, when he approached a pedestrian and snatched that person's beloved uh, on-leash pet. Subsequently, our most renowned resident mountain lion was captured and suffering various health conditions and possible injury from an auto collision was put down. I regret his woeful um, condition, but I don't lament the decision of local authorities to put P20 to end P22's life. He would only have grown more desperate left to his own devices, and that scenario would likely have ended badly both for him and us. Ultimately, he had the misfortune to live in one of the most populous metropolitan regions on the planet. But we should champion his success at doing so for as long as he did. P-22 was a remnant of the old, wild, pre-development Los Angeles, and as such, a contemporary avatar of the rich landscape of megafauna that we celebrate whenever we visit what was once known as Rancho La Brea and now houses the George C. Page Museum over on the city's west side, and of course, its bubbling legendary tar pits. Puma, mountain lion, cougar, of course, the name cougar has taken on a different meaning in recent decades, but <laughs> nevertheless, panther, even catamount, and that's a name we don't hear much nowadays, his species is known by a colorful assortment of names, and P-22 was, for us, its local ambassador. Thank you. Genevieve Arnold. Thank you. Um, it's very special to be here tonight. 
and share in this gathering and share in our love for P22 and in to the natural world which connects us all and to which we are all connected. Cat and Cave. Sunlight's shade, shadows shape, wildcats range, land so graced. Hallowed rock of granite halls, echoed silence, raptors called. Canyon spirit by your side, mountain's power in your thighs. Scent of sagebrush on your coat, earthen purr within your throat. Slanting light shafts in your eyes, scent of lilac in your sighs. Blessed respite in this dome, tilted planet, sacred home. Where earth ends and you begin, creates the grace you're held within. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. And again, I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. But what I loved was, again, P22, so many people connected to him in different ways. But he also connected us to each other. And I owe so many good friends, almost everybody you see here tonight, um, to P22. And I can't thank him enough for that. Um, but I want to also thank him and, and all of you for something else. And I was talking with Laura before the show. One of my Facebook memories popped up today, which I wanted to read to you. It's very short. Uh, this was from 2017. And it said, overheard on my hike in Griffith Park today. Doesn't a saber-toothed tiger or something live here? <laughs> you know, I, I always loved uh, and, and laughed when that memory came up because I remember very clearly being hiking in Griffith Park and overhearing that. But what I love is he instilled wonder and hope in all of us. And that is what's translating for me into this sort of global movement around living with wildlife and considering wildlife differently. Uh, I'm going to butcher this quote, but I come back to this notion of what, why so many people loved him so much and why people around the world connected to him. I mean, in his death, which, as we know, was very hard for all of us. It was just so comforting to see he was trending on Twitter. He was featured in Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, you know, that does not happen to mountain lions usually. And again, that is very hopeful for the future of wildlife and how we reconsider our relationships to wildlife. But but why, right? I mean, he's a Hollywood story, so that's probably part of it. I mean, you can't get more Hollywood. Spielberg's going to make that film, right? The small town boy making this perilous journey to make it big in Hollywood, yet still, you know, kind of a lonely guy. Um, and, you know, who can't relate to their dating life being affected by the 405 divide, right? So that's part of it. But I think really what P22 did for us was something deeper. And it wasn't just Angelinos, it was people around the world. And um, Edward Rodriguez for the LA Times early on when he showed up, wrote this incredible editorial uh, that, and this was when Meatball the Bear was hanging out. And again, I'm gonna butcher the quote, but it went something like this, that I have no doubt under the right circumstances that P22 and Meatball the Bear would dine on me if given the opportunity but I'm still rooting for them. Because if they haven't lost their wildness in a place like Los Angeles, neither have I. And that's what he did for us. He connected us to that wildness we thought we had lost in an improbable place like Los Angeles. And I wanna thank Los Angeles for stepping up and recognizing that and making a home for that remarkable creature. Not only did it change LA, it changed the world. So thank you for being here tonight. I can't, I can't see or hear any of you, but I can't wait to listen to the other talks. And I think they are, uh, you are going to move to the lobby for a book signing and um, save me one of those library cards. Thank you for having me. And this may be the last you hear from me. The snow is piling up again. Thanks again. <laughs>